called called from words to practice um, and it uh, is a series of webinars that we'll be organizing this year where we will uh, introduce the guidelines on the institution guidelines on the institutionalization including in emergencies um, and um, help you and everyone better understand them and uh, apply them in practice um, so we have an hour and a half. Um, we have a, a busy uh, schedule today with uh, some great uh, speakers. Um, so I'm going to get started right away. Uh, but before that, uh, just to say uh, very briefly that uh, the Global Coalition on Deinstitutionalization is composed of the International Disability Alliance, Inclusion International, Transforming Communities for Inclusion, ENIL Disability Rights International, the Center for Human Rights at the University of Pretoria and the Validity Foundation. And you will find out more about GCDI later in the session. Um, this hello, hello in different languages. <laughs> um, so first of all, a couple of housekeeping um, uh, issues so that you can all um, participate fully in this session. Uh, first of all, um, and I will try to speak a bit slower myself, um, first of all, we have um, sign language interpretation in this um, webinar, and we also have interpretation from English to Spanish. Uh, if you are on a laptop, you should see a little globe at the bottom of your screen where you can choose uh, the interpretation channel in which you would like to follow the webinar. Uh, if you are on a mobile phone, um, you have to click on the three dots which say more uh, and then choose the option that says language interpretation and then you will see the different languages and then you again have to choose the language which you would like to hear. Um, you also can click a button uh, to mute the original audio which means that you will only hear interpretation. Um, and you have to remember to click done to save your changes. Uh, if you would like to uh, follow closed captioning, which we um, also have uh, today, uh, you can click on the closed caption uh, button again at the bottom of your screen to start viewing the captions. Um, if you click on subtitle settings, you can choose the size of your captions and you can also choose to view the um, caption transcript by clicking on view full transcript. Um, if you would like to ask a question, we have um, two options. Um, you can write your question in the three, no, two options. You can write your question in the chat and um, colleagues from um, the Global Coalition on Deinstitutionalization will be monitoring the chat box and making sure that we answer questions. Uh, you can also raise your hand and when we have time for discussion, um, you will be called out to, to ask your question. Uh, as you can see, we are using a meeting format for this webinar, so we are hoping it is going to be uh, participatory. We will also have seven polls, um, and in case you are not um, used to polls, um, this uh, little um, a box will pop up on your screen when we launch a poll. Uh, you can read the question and the options provided and choose the option um, that you would like. If it says multiple choice, it means you can pick more options. And then when uh, we think that everybody was able to um, answer the poll, um, we will show the results on the screen and the results, of course, will be anonymous. Um, and finally, some uh, accessibility tips. Uh, please do say your name and organization when you speak. Uh, use plain language. Please do not use jargon. Uh, keep your microphone, microphone muted so there is not, no background noise. Uh, keep your point as short and as clear as you can. Be respectful of um, everybody's time and please do not use um, acronyms. Uh, and finally, this was it for the housekeeping rules. 
Um, on the agenda today, uh, we have, first of all, um, a presentation by uh, Amalia Gamio, um, our dear um, colleague and a friend from the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disability. Uh, she is actually the vice chair and she is a member of the working group on deinstitutionalization. She will present the guidelines. Um, after that, uh, we will hear from uh, colleagues uh, Dragana Ciric Milovanovic and Stephen Allen, um, who will speak a little bit about the Global Coalition on Deinstitutionalization. Then we will hear from uh, colleagues from the ground about how the guidelines are being in implemented um, in practice in three different um, in three uh, different parts of the world. Um, Richa Sharma, uh, my colleague from uh, GCDI, will introduce them all when we come to that. Uh, we are then we will then have um, a session um, uh, where we get to discuss, and we also have some polls, which will be moderated by uh, Sabiha Majid, also from GCDI. And uh, finally, um, Manel Amiri, uh, also from GCDI, will tell you what sort of version of the guidelines we have available at the moment. And we will close with uh, Nadia Khadad, also uh, from GCDI and from ENEL, in about an hour and a half. Um, but before I give the words to Amalia. Uh, I would like uh, to invite you to complete our first poll, which is going to tell us a little bit about um, who we have uh, in the webinar today. There are two questions. Which type of organization are you representing? Uh, which is a multiple choice question and which region are you from? It is also a multiple choice question if you are from different regions at the same time. Um, so I would invite uh, my colleague Rita to launch the, the poll. You will see the questions both in uh, English and in Spanish at the same time. And um, you have to scroll down uh, a little bit to answer the questions. Uh, as I said, it is a multiple choice. You can choose more answers. And once you when you are ready, you just click on submit. Okay. Just leave a little bit of time for everyone uh, to complete. And perhaps now we could uh, see the results, Rita. We're still receiving answers. So maybe still receiving. OK. Let's no just problem. give one, a few more seconds. We can maybe share now. Yeah, go ahead, Rita. You can launch the result. Uh, okay, so thank you very much for completing. So we can see we have mostly people from um, OPDs, Organizations of Persons with Disabilities, uh, and other civil society organizations. Uh, we have um, the majority of people with disabilities themselves, which is great. Uh, we have mostly people from Europe uh, with us, uh, but also quite a few people from Africa, um, Asia and North America. Um, so thank you very much for that. And um, we have one more poll uh, before we get to Amalia, um, which is to what extent are you aware of the guidelines? There are just three options, very aware, somewhat aware and not aware at all. Uh, Rita, can you please launch that? We are asking you before Amalia tells you all about the guidelines. <laughs> And hopefully that will make you a little bit more <laughs> aware. So please choose um, choose one one of just one of the options. Uh, 
Okay, Rita, did people respond? Yeah, I think uh, we could we could end it can... here. Okay, so we can see the results, perhaps. All right, so um, the majority of people are somewhat aware. Um, there are very uh, quite a few people who are very aware of the guidelines and some not aware at all. So we hope that the, this, this webinar and the other, especially the coming webinars, will make us all much more aware of the guidelines. So I will um, end here. This was our last poll. I will now um, give the floor over to Amalia. I have already uh, introduced briefly Amalia, but to say a couple of words, Amalia is from Mexico. Um, she was she has been on the committee since 2018, so for six years now. This is her second mandate. Um, and in the committee, she has personally worked on the development of the guidelines on the institutionalization. She has worked on general comment eight on the right to work and employment and is currently working on the general comment nine on article 11. She's doing many more things, but <laughs> this is just a brief introduction. Uh, so, Amalia, I will hand over to you. I do hope that everybody can now see the sign language interpreter. Um, that we have resolved that. Um, so, Amalia, please, the floor is yours. I'm going Thank to mute you. myself. Thank you, Ines. Thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias por la invitación a mis queridos amigos de la Coalición Global para la desinstitucionalización. Me encanta verlos de nuevo. Eh, como ya dijeron, yo estoy en el, en el grupo de trabajo sobre desinstitucionalización en el comité, así que tuve la fortuna de trabajar en la elaboración e incluso me tocó dar el mazazo de aprobación a las directrices sobre desinstitucionalización. Bueno, voy a comentar que... El comité pues venía observando la falta de aplicación tanto del artículo 19, el derecho a vivir de forma independiente y a ser incluido en la comunidad, de su observación general número 5 y del artículo 12 sobre igualdad ante la ley. Todo esto se agravó durante la pandemia y entonces el comité observó altas tasas de infección y muerte entre las personas con discapacidad segregadas en instituciones. Fue terrible, ¿no? Eh, la guerra en Ucrania también nos mostró cómo, incluso con la guerra actual, ya sabemos que nos está dejando atrás a las personas con discapacidad, especialmente aquellas confinadas. Todo ello llevó al comité a considerar la necesidad urgente de crear un grupo de trabajo sobre la desinstitucionalización en 2020. Una vez creado, la primera tarea fue consultar a la sociedad civil de personas con discapacidad psicosocial e intelectual para elaborar las directrices de desinstitucionalización. Esto fue en un claro ejemplo de seguimiento del mandato del artículo 4.3 y su observación general número 7. La consulta se llevó a cabo en siete regiones del mundo. Fue interesantísima, fue una consulta muy amplia, muy bien recibida, eh, hubo enorme participación, se obtuvieron valiosas aportaciones que dieron lugar al primer borrador, participó, la, por supuesto, la coalición global de desis, para la desinstitucionalización y universidades de México e Inglaterra. Cada nuevo borrador se sometió a consulta de las organizaciones de personas con discapacidad, de manera que estas fueron unas directrices hechas por las personas con discapacidad. Realmente fue un arduo trabajo de más de dos años y medio y culminó con la aprobación de las directrices por el Pleno del Comité el 9 de septiembre de 2022 con gran alegría y celebración por todos sus miembros. De manera que ahora tenemos el artículo 12 y su observación general número 1, el artículo 19 y su observación general número 5, el artículo 14 y sus directrices, que no, no siempre son bien conocidas, sobre la libertad y seguridad de la persona, y las directrices sobre desinstitucionalización, incluidas las situaciones de emergencia. Un conjunto de herramientas a disposición de los estados parte 
para que ya se devuelva a las personas con discapacidad psicosocial e intelectual su dignidad como seres humanos, su autonomía y su capacidad de decidir por sí mismas en las decisiones que les concierne. De las magníficas directrices me gustaría destacar, pues claro, como ya decíamos, que se basen en artículos de la convención, que resalten el obligado involucramiento de las personas con discapacidad psicosocial e intelectual en el proceso, que se marque claramente que es un proceso. La interseccionalidad tan importante de la que tanto hablamos y a veces no ponemos en práctica. La justicia restaurativa, que ya sabemos, antes se pensaba que era solo para grupos de violencia muy grande. Bueno, las personas con discapacidad han sido sometidas por años a terrible violencia en los centros de segregación. Y que se hable de las situaciones de emergencia es importantísimo. Que se destaque reiteradamente el deber de los estados parte en la desinstitucionalización. Ellos no parecen haber entendido que es una obligación emanada de la convención de su, desde su entrada en vigor en 2008. Me parece muy importante que se puntualice la inoperancia del argumento de que las personas con discapacidad pueden elegir, entre comillas, la institucionalización. Eso me encanta que se puntualice. Las directrices no dejan nada fuera del proceso, ni la legislación, la necesidad de hacer enmiendas en las legislaciones, ni la necesidad de proporcionar una vivienda accesible y un trabajo digno a las personas que dejan la institución. Se contempla paso a paso, resaltando siempre que se debe devolver la dignidad y la autonomía a las personas con discapacidad. No deja de repetir que es fundamental para su desarrollo el respeto a la capacidad jurídica de la persona, garantizando que la elección sobre dónde y con quién vivir sea real y efectiva, para lo cual requiere de apoyos comunitarios amplios y de acceso a los servicios que se brindan a todos, sin dejar atrás la necesidad de asignación de recursos y llega hasta el punto de que se hable de la preparación para abandonar la institución y cómo se ve a las personas con discapacidad ya viviendo en la comunidad. Y por supuesto, nos habla del seguimiento y la importancia de contar con datos desglosados. No deja nada fuera. Actualmente yo me siento preocupada por la implementación. Nada menos ahora que acaban de preguntar quiénes están presentes en este webinar, no hay nadie de, de, de gobierno, que es lo que más nos preocupa. Ciertamente la elaboración y publicación de las directrices causó una enorme y entusiasta recepción entre la sociedad civil de personas con discapacidad. Tenemos analizado que la observación general número uno y estas directrices han sido con mucho los dos documentos que más entusiasta recepción han tenido por las organizaciones de personas con discapacidad. De hecho, se han realizado múltiples seminarios en diferentes partes del mundo, en Asia, en América Latina, en Europa, para la difusión de las directrices. Ahora mismo estamos en uno importantísimo. Esto es realmente digno de resaltarse, pero no he visto el mismo entusiasmo entre los gobiernos. Hace unos días, y ya casi termino porque se me viene el tiempo encima, estuve en la presentación de una muy interesante película realizada por Noruega sobre las coerciones, los tratamientos e institucionalizaciones forzadas. La película se basó en las normas de la Organización Mundial de la Salud sobre salud mental, sobre cuya última versión nuestro comité envió una amplia explicación de por qué no se sumaba a aprobarlas. Al final de la película yo comenté sobre las directrices sobre desinstitucionalización, incluidas las situaciones de emergencia, y la respuesta que a mí me asombró fue, gracias por compartir, no las conocíamos, lo que por supuesto me causó una enorme preocupación. Así que yo planteo a esta mesa y, y, y pregunto y les pido ayuda, ¿qué más podríamos hacer nosotros desde el comité o desde la sociedad, para que las directrices sean implementadas por los gobiernos de los estados parte. Disculpen, creo que me pasé un poco de tiempo. Muchísimas gracias por su atención. Uh, thank you very much, Amalia. 
uh, for this presentation. Uh, don't worry. Um, and thank you for ending uh, on this important question. What can we do to make sure that the guidelines are actually implemented by those who need to be implementing them? Um, now, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to um, Dragana and Stephen um, to tell us a little bit uh, briefly about the role of the Global Coalition um, in um, this process of promoting the guidelines and a little bit about the coalition itself. Uh, Dragan, I think you are starting first. So I will hand over to you. Yes, thank you very much, Ines. Uh, and um, uh, good morning, good uh, afternoon, good evening, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be with you. Uh, today, um, I will tell a little bit more, int introduce the Global Coalition on the institutionalization, because I believe there are some people who may not be as aware uh, about uh, our role, uh, and Stephen will talk a little bit about our plans, which this webinar is part of. Um, so, uh, the Global Coalition is um, a a coalition of seven international disability rights organizations uh, of persons with disabilities and civil society organizations who are formed around the same goal, collective goal of promoting the right to independent living and inclusion in the community for persons with disabilities and as under Article 19 of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. We adopted a joint position, uh, which is also uh, recognized uh, that institutionalization is a discriminatory practice against persons with disabilities, and there is no justification to perpetuate it. Institutionalization can never be considered as a form of protection of children or adults with disabilities, and despite, but despite obligations under international law, persons with disabilities worldwide continue to be detained in institutions. Uh, so our vision is to promote widespread awareness and implementation of the, uh, of the guidelines on the institutionalization through a range of collective actions, including dissemination, awareness raising, capacity building of organizations of persons with disabilities, policy and decision makers, service providers, and other stakeholders. Uh, how everything started. So it all started in 2020 when organizations gathered around what was then called COVID-19 Disability Rights Monitor, but five of the current members were part of that initiative. So we launched a rapid independent monitoring of state measures responding to the crisis caused by the pandemic globally. And during the period of three and a half months, we collected more than 2000 testimonies from 135 countries across the world. And what really was highlighted uh, was a large number of deaths and extensive human rights violations against children and adults in congregate settings, uh, which eventually led to the creation of the working group uh, of the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities dedicated to the institutionalization. So after that, our seven organizations got together to support uh, the committee and the, in the process of the development uh, of the guidelines on the institutionalization. Uh, we dedicated uh, our efforts to uh, support people with disabilities worldwide, especially those most affected by institutionalization to participate in the pro process of developing the guidelines and also throughout the process of public consultations uh, and adoption further dissemination. So from January to June 2021, uh, we supported the committee in organizing seven regional consultations spanning every region of the world, where more than 500 women with disabilities, older persons, survivors of institutionalization, 
persons with albinism, grassroots and self-advocacy organizations and others presented testimonies, experiences and proposals. Some of the examples I just want to share, uh, which were received from people with disabilities uh, in institutions. Uh, for example, institutional trauma needs to be addressed in the guidelines. It is my view that there is a lack of focus on preventing persons with disabilities from being placed in institutional care in the first place. And that we also need to make sure disabled people won't be forced into poverty when they move out of institutions because of the lack of life skills and financial support. So everything uh, the coalition has been doing was really to bring forward the voice and experiences of people either still living in institutions or, or with a history of institutionalization and put forward their voice um, and use that to really uh, influence the final uh, outcome uh, of the guidelines. During the process of public consultations, when the draft was released, um, the Global Coalition facilitated over 50 written submissions and organized a series of webinars, trainings, uh, translations to facilitate as broad participation as possible uh, in uh, all parts uh, of the world. Uh, during 2022 and 2023, both uh, relating to the draft guidelines and later after the guidelines were adopted, uh, we involved approximately 730 participants um, in different capacity building and, and training ev events in preparation uh, of submissions and also in the process of dissemination. Uh, you will hear a little bit later about all the translations that uh, you can now find um, uh, on our website and the website of the committee. So I won't list all of them, but uh, that was one of our efforts to make um, the guidelines as accessible as possible uh, throughout uh, different regions uh, of the world. Uh, what uh, we, we have dedicated uh, to um, collaborate with regional and local actors in bringing the guidelines closer uh, to people and to local contexts. And also we've adopted joint statements and positions on issues that pertain to the enjoyment of the right to live independently and being included in the community. For example, we are getting, we got together to advocate for the institutionalization in the situation of emergencies in the context of Ukraine conflict. And also uh, our recent uh, joint statement concerns um, a position on a large foster care as yet another form of institutionalization of children. Uh, all of this shows us that there is much more to be done. And before I pass the floor to Stephen, who will tell you more about our plans, I just can't emphasize enough that everything we've done is thanks to people, um, testimonies of people uh, who are, um, have been institutionalized uh, and who were brave enough to talk about their experiences and share their uh, experiences with us. So with great uh, gratitude to them, uh, I'm now inviting Stephen to take the over. Thank you very much, uh, Dragana um, uh, Ines, um, and it's also wonderful to see you as well, Amalia. I don't know how you manage to be in so many places simultaneously. Um, so firstly, just to briefly about me, my name is Stephen Allen. I'm the Executive Director of the Validity Foundation. Um, we're not an OPD, but we are a specialised uh, human rights advocacy organisation dedicated to promoting legal or undertaking legal strategies that advance the human rights of persons with disabilities. And for us, being a member of the Global Coalition on Deinstitutionalization has been an important experience. 
We have known oh. from our work in Central and Eastern Europe and in other parts of the world for many, many years that institutions continue to uh, be maintained by many governments. We know that the most serious human rights violations occur in those places, and we often represent victims of torture and ill treatment inside, but those are just at the high end of the issues that we tackle. Being segregated from society has a profound effect for individuals, but it also has a profound social impact as well. And for us, the birth of the Global Coalition on Deinstitutionalization has given us new hope that we can now drive the agenda and really do take steps which can mean that institutions can be demolished brick by brick and that people with disabilities can have their right returned to live in the communities that they come from. All of the organizations in the Global Coalition on Deinstitutionalization have been working hard since the adoption of the guidelines to promote and disseminate the guidelines. We have, in some cases, heard some positive signs from a few governments, but I have to say we've heard too little from too many. We need to come together to strengthen the shared commitment and in Amalia's uh, words, we need to push governments to take action. We need to ensure that there is stronger collective action. There are two parts to the guidelines in my view that change the narrative. The first is that they adopt a reparative justice approach. This is not just about social issues. These are about profound human rights violations that can only be eliminated through governments committing to deinstitutionalization. Secondly, and deliberately, the guidelines center not only the experiences of survivors of institutionalization, but their role in guiding and leading deinstitutionalization strategies. For us, that is crucial. This is not just about reorganizing social protection and social systems. This is about recognizing the harms of long-term segregation and about making amends for the future. Since the guidelines were adopted, we have been discussing how we can support a global movement to really make uh, steps forward here. Some of the activities we will be undertaking are set out on the slide that is on the screen. One of the first of these, with the leadership of the European Network on Independent Living, is going to be the, uh, the creation of an online toolkit on deinstitutionalization. We know that narratives become complex around how to achieve this in reality, but there are practices we will collect them and we will disseminate them. We want people to go from words to action. Secondly, we also want to conduct another global survey. The purpose of this will be to hear both from persons with disabilities and governments about their experiences of, of implementing the guidelines. We want to identify prom promising practices and we want to build the momentum for real change. This webinar series is part of that. This is providing a space where we hope to bring the movement together and also expand knowledge of the practical steps that can be taken to make real progress. Funders have a crucial role to play. All too often the old charity model of development uh, remains in place, and this facilitates reinstitutionalization or even the expansion of institutions in countries around the world. The donors need to come and talk to the disability rights community, and we hope that they will respect the guidelines in what they do to come. The Global Coalition on Deinstitutionalization is also particularly enthusiastic an understanding of the role of regional networks of persons with disabilities to advocate for the implementation 
um, of these guidelines. We have a network in Europe. There has been the development of a network in the Americas. And we also know there is a, a network in operation uh, in the Asia Pacific region. And we need more of these networks. The Global Coalition on Deinstitutionalization is willing to uh, be in touch with all of these networks. And we want to support each other, learn from each other, develop joint advocacy strategies that, uh, that move this agenda forward. Finally, we want to keep deinstitutionalization high on the agenda. That is also at the global level, whereas we move in the next few years towards the completion of the sustainable, sustainable uh, development goals period, the so-called agenda 2030, it is crucial that independent living and deinstitutionalization are a core component of long-term international development agendas. Indeed, other narratives can present risks. Um, we think that it is crucial that the guidelines on DI are acknowledged as the, the most important normative standard to take, uh, to take action against the history of institutionalization, which, we, uh, which I've spoken about. We also want to hear from all of you. What do you think we should be doing as a global coalition? How can we support your advocacy? How can we really get governments to sit up and listen? Let us know. And if you'd like to, you can email us. Um, and there's an email address here, which is contact at gc-di.org. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stephen and Dragana, for this very comprehensive overview of what has been done and what uh, we will be doing. And now I will hand over to my colleague Richa Sharma from uh, Transforming Communities for Inclusion, who will take over moderation. Over to you, Richa. Thank you. Thank you, Ines. Um, so hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. My name is Richa Sharma, and I, I'm with Transforming Communities for Inclusion, CCI Global, as a research and advocacy officer. Um, we are a global membership-based organization of persons with psychosocial disabilities. And as mentioned, we are a part of the Global Coalition on Deinstitutionalization. So now that we have shared the evolution of the guidelines on deinstitutionalization, and the future plans of the Global Coalition, it's time to listen in to what is the current situation of implementation of the guidelines on deinstitutionalization in different regions across the world. We are honored to have with us three leaders and disability advocates from three regions who will be sharing with us their experience of working with and advocating the guidelines in their respective countries. First, I would like to invite Ms. Sylvia Kwan, who is representing the Inter-American Coalition on Deinstitutionalization. Her brief profile has been displayed on the slide for your reference. Over to you, Sylvia. Thank you, Risha, and greetings to everybody. Um, I'm very uh, happy to be here uh, with so many people. Um, that are quite familiar to, to me. And um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm based in Guatemala, that is Central America. And uh, I represent a local uh, OPD, a Colectivo Vida Independiente, but I also sit uh, on the board of Disability Rights International. So I'm very pleased to be here also representing those two uh, organizations. So I will switch to Spanish. Um, so you get ready for the interpretation, as that is my mother tongue. Thank you. So, um, voy a presentar la coalición interamericana para la desinstitucionalización. La coalición se confirmó, se conformó en el año 2022, y en ella participan actualmente 30 organizaciones de personas con discapacidad de diversas discapacidades, pero también organizaciones de personas con discapacidad psicosocial, usuarios... Psychosocial uh, disabilities and uh, former uses of psychiatry. 
and other organizations of the civil society and people with uh, disability with different trajectories besides other people that are also joining to the coalition. These organizations are uh, currently from different uh, countries of the region, basically Argentina, Chile, Peru, Colombia, Guatemala, Mexico, and um, United States, but also organizations with the region that are interesting, interested on the coalition, they could be part of it and part of the efforts we are uh, pushing. The coalition has uh, wanted to uh, use these guidelines for this institutionalization and some of the strategic decisions that I'm going to mention are the ones that we have been working on as coalition and also organizations that are part of the coalition. Those include reforms, legal reforms. Where is it? Okay, I'll go find it. Sorry, somebody open the your mic. Bueno, estas acciones incluyen reformas. These actions include uh, legal reforms for the recognition of the legal capacity of a uh, OPD and people with disabilities and enforce uh, uh, institutionalization. Another strategic action and a key one we are leading is the formulation of policies for the disinstitutionalization in consistence with the guidelines, with the guideline. And um, parallelly, we are creating systems of support for independent life of people with disability based on the principles of consent, the free um, and informed consent, and the respect of human rights. Also, the will and the preference of people with disabilities. We have included uh, even some actions of awareness so people can have access to the guidelines for this standardization and also towards to public servants, organizations of of persons with disability and also their families. We have identified that these guidelines are really unknown. These actions have to include the effort and the right approach of uh, persons with disability and the um, medical system also against discrimination and stigmatization. We have also tried to strengthen organizations of persons with disability, empowerment of people with disability that have been institutionalized. And we want to foster their participation in all the stages and processes of this, this institutionalization inclu and inclusion at the communitarian level. And within all these processes, we have been leading and actions we have been taken and strategic decisions, it's important to make consultations um, to people with disabilities through their organizations they are represented through. Finally, at the regional level, we have been also started uh, starting with good practices, um, meetings among the different countries, and mostly giving support to those organizations that are in countries where they face a lot of challenges in the fulfillment of um, policies for this disinstitutionalization. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you for sharing that. Now we'll move to Uganda, which will be represented by Ms. Robina Alambuya, who's from the Triumph Mental Health Support and Recovery Program. Over to you, Robina. Thank you so much. Yes, I begin by sharing with you the peace, joy, and the love from the author of life. Today we are talking about life and the issues of the institutionalization are issues of life and death. 
as you've heard, Robina Lambria from Uganda. But I represent voices from the grassroots because I serve there, I have lived there. I also serve my community, persons with sexual disabilities, um, on national platforms and also regional, like the Africa Disability Forum and also transforming communities for inclusion. On all, from all those levels that I connect with, they are voices and stories of my sisters and brothers across all ages of what they have experienced just like me as a survivor of institutions. And at such a time, time may not allow me to tell my own story about the life in institutions and the life in communities that are not transformed to look at persons with disabilities. And in this case, persons with actual disabilities, intellectual disabilities, looking at us as human beings. I just pray that one day you'll be able to access the full story. However, at this moment, sometimes we just need a, a time of silence to connect as human beings because we are just not talking about topics. No, we are talking about our lives and lives of human beings. You just allow me every time that we talk about this issue of institutions, I personally cannot help. I always just pray to God to hold my emotions. Just allow me, the voice still comes in me. At one time, strategically, I decided to take on uh, a volunteer job in one of the psychiatric institutions in Uganda. Just to see, that's the only way I could access to see what exactly is happening there from the time for me I left. And there was this younger man at a university level. Every time she would see me, he would see me, he would say, Robina, you are my only hope out of here. You are my only hope out of here. And I, would, I kept on crying because I, I felt he has so much hope that I could help out. But the way the system was, I had no power. I only prayed to the almighty God that Lord just find a way because the family had thrown him there and was working with the medical people to keep him there. I tried even to go to the, to the home, to the family and see the, 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 um, the mother had died, but just to see that, mo that the mother who was there and the father and talk to them, they were not willing at that time to get him out of there. Just that's one story, I will not say more. I wanted to bring it to connect. So because of that, Triumph, an organization of persons with sexual disabilities, due to our experiences in the communities at all levels, from family level and other levels, policy levels, and also our experiences in the institutions, we have begun doing something on this. Our core value is love. If as human beings, we can have the real love for one another. So our core value is love. And our vision is a world where all persons with psychosocial disabilities will be able to be fully included in the communities. So we began, persons with sexual disabilities in Uganda, we began doing things, but we, we didn't know how to name them. But the things we've been doing, our many initiatives of many small organizations at local level and national level of persons with sexual disabilities, we've been doing different initiatives, but we didn't know that we, to name it until this name came out. Deinstitutionalization. Then we began connecting. I remember one time when one of us out of pain, he got out of his house 
and went to, to raise a case and he got support from our national organization of persons with disabilities, that is Nodipu. They got lawyers and said, I want to sue the government of Uganda. I want to see, to, to go to the, how do I do this? They said, go to the constitutional court. And you can read that story. I mean, that uh, that Daniel Oiga case against uh, Attorney General for the legatory language, which also like enslaves us. So Triumph, with the support of um, transforming communities for inclusion, we decided to do something at a local level as a community-based organization at that time. To begin with our city, because we had had a story, not a story, but an experience in our city when they got vehicles and they rounded up all persons with this, uh, psychological disabilities and other disabilities that, that were moving around in the city and they all took them in the institution, the National uh, Psychiatric Hospital. So we decided to do something and we began by uh, making a, a rapid assessment. Do our local leaders, government leaders at a local level, local government, do they understand, have they heard? And what we had, what we, as we, we do this assessment, going to them, so we're there to raise awareness, to popularize so that they may know and they know so they can know their role instead of thinking of one thing of rounding us up and throwing at us in a, a psychiatric institution. Then we also did uh, bilateral meetings. We said now we need to speak now one-on-one -on -one and help them to realize what they can do in their offices. And that one we also did. Then we also brought them together to discuss these things together well, persons with sexual disabilities are also there. And they were able to give their testimonies about living in the community and how it helps us to live our lives and to make meaningful community, a meaningful contribution to our community, and then the life experiences in the institutions. So we wanted to win their goodwill so that they can begin each one working. And they were able to come together and to realize each of the departments, the health department, the, the, the community departments, which was key, how it is going to work with the education department and the uh, environment and uh, emergencies. After that, we asked them to make commitments and indeed they they made recorded commitments. We got key stakeholders. They made, we recorded their commitment. Each one saying for me, at least I will begin by doing this and that. And then what amazed us is that they began saying, Triumph, we need you more. We need you to, to really train us more and want you even to go more in the structures in the communities and train different uh, uh, um, people who are supposed to implement this at all levels. And they said, please, let there be more funders, people to fund this so that we, we can have more of this. Then, um, as I said that we looked at, I want to thank, um, transforming communities for inclusion. At one time in Uganda, they, they supported one of the women with sexual disabilities from UNICEF to just to do, um, to do a short research, yes. Robina, I'm sorry. Uh, can you please uh, take a few seconds and wrap it up just because we are running behind time? Okay, thank you so much. So uh, as I conclude, because uh, what I, 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 I prepared has, will, will also can always be accessed. But I just want to conclude like this. In our local initiative, we just discovered that there is need for awareness, for popularizing these um, guidelines. 
Secondly, there is also need to build the capacity of persons with the psychosocial disabilities. I want to end by saying these stories cannot end and we have to continue talking about this. But I end by giving hope that even though we have gone through all that, persons with sexual disabilities, we've also speak the same language. We know that we really need an intervention of the almighty who is beyond human beings to support us get out of this and be able to live our life with choice and voice, living independently in the communities like other people on an equal basis with others. Thank you. May God bless you as you, we work out together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rubina. So now we move on to the Republic of Korea and I invite Hanbyeol Han Choi, who represents the Korean Disability Forum. Over to you, Hanbyeol, thank you. Thank you so much and very glad to meet you all colleagues from all around the world. I am Hanbyeol Choi from the Korean Disability Forum, KDF, and we are an umbrella organization of 17 disabled people's organizations. So um, uh, what I'm going to talk to you about today is not by KDF own, but by all the organizations, uh, our member organizations. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to let you know about that. And um, I'm truly honored to be here today to tell you about how the Korean society takes the UN guidelines on the institutionalization. Um, and since its um, establishment, um, Korean disabled people's organizations have considered the guidelines as a map towards a fully inclusive society. Um, thus, we first translate them into Korean uh, so, that, uh, so that more people can access the guidelines. And then we made an easy to understand version of the guidelines too. And we found out that, um, that the guidelines uh, are also a very good tool for our activism. So we, we reflect the principles of the guidelines to our works and we demand lawmakers and the government to follow the guidelines, et cetera. Uh, and we also study um, the guidelines, which include various conferences, seminars, and developing indicators to assess how the Korean society is implementing the guidelines. And um, due to our efforts, uh, now two bills based on the guidelines, um, which were submitted to the National Assembly last year. So the one is for closing institutions and the, and the other one is about redress for the survivors. Mm. However, there are also serious backlashes as well. Um, for example, last year, a Catholic priest, um, also a director of an institution himself, compared persons with learning disabilities to animals based on their IQs, like intelli intelligence quotient, um, quen <laughs> sorry, uh, quotient. And he insisted that the people same as parrots and cats should not leave institutions. And also a representative of a huge welfare organization, which has lots of institutions, um, wrote in a newspaper that the guidelines are too radical and irrational. Um, and and uh, maybe next slide. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. And since no country has not and will not accomplish perfect deinstitutionalization, he said it is just a fantasy. Um, not only the, the institutions, but also politicians, journalists, and professors pro to institutions say that persons with disabilities and their parents are literally dying of forced deinstitutionalization, which is not a true at all. Uh, they, their death is just because of the very poor services in the community. But I understand that it is natural that people have a fear of changes. 
Uh, thus, that's why the guidelines paragraph 36 said that the state parties should raise public understanding on the Article 19 of the convention, um, targeting persons with disabilities, family members, police makers, and service providers. Um, however, the Korean government lacks will to do this, I think, and rather it goes exactly opposite to the guidelines. And um, next slide, please. Uh, for example, the Ministry of Health and Welfare announced last month that it will establish two more new institutions this year. And it also says that downsizing institutions is also a form of deinstitutionalization. And the, the ministry also said that the institution should be maintained because um, they are also an option for the right to choose where to live of the persons with disabilities. Very ridiculous. And uh, Seoul, the capital city of Korea, recently announced that since the deinstitutionalization costs a lot, it should be in a rational way. So only the people with capacity can live independently. Um, I don't think, uh, the government and the cities do are doing this because they don't know about the guidelines because we kept saying about this. So I think now the institutionalization is in very political phase. And that's why we are trying to pull the power to the disability rights. And next slide, please. In Korea, now we are expecting a general election in April. So uh, the um, disabled people's organizations, especially the survivors group, established a fake campaign party called the Institutionalization Right Party. And the slogan of the party is I vote for the disability rights. And uh, now they are demanding candidates to follow the convention, including the guidelines for our rights to deinstitutionalization and independent living and uh, right to work, right to move and right to education, etc. So we believe that when the wave is high, the anchor of a board should be stronger. So that's why we want to cling to the anchor, the guidelines on uh, deinstitutionalization so that our lives and our dignity uh, will not float away. So thank you again for your works on these valuable guidelines and thank uh, also to the Global Coalition about to, for uh, your efforts to make this from words to practice. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Anbiol. So now before I end this session, we have four questions for you all. Um, you can see the first question on your screen. Um, and I'll request Rita to please uh, run the first poll question so that all of you can respond to it. Yeah. So you can see the question and we'll give you a we'll give you a short time to respond to it. And then we'll display the results just to get an idea of what, to what extent are persons with disabilities, OPDs in your country aware of the guidelines? Um, Rita, are we still getting the responses? Yeah, I will say to just give a few more seconds because responses are still coming in. Sure. I think we can end it now. Yes, please. And we get, yeah. So, okay, the results show that majority are somewhat aware and 35% are not aware at all. So that gives us some impetus to really work in the direction of really promoting the guidelines on the institutionalization in our own disability constituencies. Um, and we'll go to the next question. On the next poll. Yes, so the question is to what extent is the responsible government body in your country aware of the guidelines? Uh, Rita, can you please uh, play the poll right now? Yeah. So we'll again give a few seconds for you all to respond.
um, Rita, can we display it now or still getting responses? Mm, I suggest to wait just a few more seconds. Responses are still coming in. Okay, sure. I think we put them here. Yes. Okay, so a majority majority actually talking about what we've also heard from the other speakers that governments are not really aware of the guidelines and somewhat aware is the next response of the majority. So yes, thank you. Thank you for this session. Thank you for participating in the polls and thank you to the speakers. And Ines, I think we can go on to the next session. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sabiha. Um, I'm, I'm a researcher at the Center for Human Rights based at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. And I will be moderating this session. So basically the purpose of this session is for us as the GCDI to understand um, which parts of the guidelines um, people don't understand, you know, what we should be focusing on in our future webinars. Um, Rita, could you please display poll question five? So the first question is, what chapters of the guidelines are the most complicated to understand? Um, we'll just give you a few minutes to respond, or a few seconds rather. Rita, are we still getting responses on this? Yes, let's wait a second since this one is a bit longer. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, Rita, I think we can maybe try to display the responses now. We're still receiving some, but if you want, I can start sharing a bit of the, yes, yes, few of the answers. Uh, so far, the most selected answer seems to be uh, the enabling legal and policy frameworks that has received majority mm -hmm. of the votes uh, so far. Uh, and it is followed by the section on remedies, reparation, and redress. So, so far, those okay. seem to be the two that have received the most answers. But as I say, we're still receiving a few answers. Okay, um, if there's anyone um, in the meeting as well that would maybe like to share for a quick uh, 30 seconds, you know, what exactly um, you've, you've been finding difficult to understand, um, I think that would also be helpful for us. So if there's anyone that would like to share some feedback, you can raise your hand um, and we would give you the floor to speak for 30 seconds. Okay, I don't see any hands. Okay, Caesar, please go ahead. Um, Caesar, I see that your hand was up, but it's, it's no longer up. Would you still like to make a contribution? He's muted, Sabita. It's, you're muted, Caesar. Okay, I don't see him in the meeting any longer. No, 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 he's here. And you're. I think oh. you're unmuted now. Yep. Okay, please go ahead, Caesar. I was just going to say, it is a lot of political will, and they have the need to face 
very powerful lobbies or even within the DPO. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caesar. Um, is there anyone else that would like to contribute to what Caesar has said or anything else? We could um, maybe, if not, uh, show now the results. Yes, yes, that would be great. Please go ahead, Dita. Oh, okay. So it looks like the results are, <laughs> there's no majority, I would say, um, but 38% for enabling legal and policy framework, um, remedies, reparations, and redress with 28%, um, emergency deinstitutionalization in situations of risk and uh, humanitarian emergencies, that's also at 26%. Um, Understanding and implementing key elements of deinstitutionalization at 23%, um, and also inclusive community support services systems and networks at 21%. So, yeah, from this poll, it looks like there might be difficulties with understanding all of the chapters. Um, so, I think this is definitely something that we as the GCDI will be taking into account moving forward. Uh, Rita, I think we can move on to the next poll question when you're ready. So question six is the formats that you may prefer for the workshop sessions. Um, do you maybe prefer a lecture format, group activities, case studies, or panel discussions? Uh, but if there's also in maybe any other suggestions uh, that you could add into the chat, I think that would also be helpful for us to decide on the format for our future webinars. Okay, we'll just give a few, a few minutes for responses. And as I mentioned, if there may be any other suggestions that are not included on the poll, um, you can also include those in the chat session so that we are also aware of, you know, other possible formats that we could use. Rita, are we still getting responses on? This question. We have received uh, 40 responses, if you would like me to share at the moment. Yeah, I, th I think that would be good. That's more than half the, the group that have responded. Okay, I'll then the... You should be able to see the results. Yes, I can now see it. And it looks like the majority would prefer either case study or panel discussion um, format. Um, yeah, I think a panel discussion format is actually a very good format because um, with a panel discussion, you would get feedback from, well, not feedback, but expertise from, you know, various experts in the field. And then, you know, there would also be a question and answer session. Yeah, so I think panel discussion and case studies, something we can consider going forward. Um, Rita, do we know how many have responded on, on this question? 41, 41 persons have responded in total. Okay, I, I think let's give them a few more seconds before- They cannot longer on. answer, so. Oh, okay. Okay, then I think we can go ahead to the next one the final question. So question seven is what part of the guidelines would you like the thematic workshops to address specifically? Um, so this is a short answer. You can, type, um, you can type your response into the box in 200 characters. So since this is a typed answer, we'll give you a, um, a few extra minutes to respond to this. Um, and if anyone would like to share in the chat as well, or maybe raise your hand and we can give you the floor to speak.
I see Winfred in the chat is also suggesting panel discussion for the previous question. Thank you, Winfred, that, that is very helpful. Is there anyone else with comments, or suggestions? Okay, I don't see anything in the chat and I don't see any hands either. So we'll just give you a few minutes to type your responses. Um, I actually have a question that I want to open up to the floor. Um, so how do, how does, okay, anyone can respond to this, member of the GCDI or um, any of our participants. Um, how can we as a civil society uh, actually make our governments aware of the guidelines? Does anyone have any suggestions on that? Um, I know, unfortunately, with governments, we find that very often that they commit, they say that they're going to commit to adopting or implementing, um, you know, all of these instruments, but they don't end up doing that. Um, so what can we as civil society perhaps do um, to ensure that governments actually adopt and implement the things that they say they're going to implement? Um, does anyone have any Maybe comments or suggestions on that. Uh, yes, Caesar, please go ahead. First of all, I think that people are not fully aware of the extent to which the DI directive or guidelines extend. So people don't have the awareness and therefore they don't have a solid ground on which to lay the floor, their feet to be able to uh, Tell the authorities if the people or if disabled people organization do not understand the guidelines. It is the, it will be difficult for them or for us to convince the authorities to change the situation. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Caesar. I think if I can maybe try to summarize what you have said, um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but. Um, we need to start with raising awareness um, and, and, you know, strengthening capacity. So um, not just amongst governments, but I think at grassroots level, um, and then maybe work, the, work our way up. Um, I see there are also some responses in the chat. Theodore says, sorry about that. Yeah, Theodore yeah, says incorporate the CRPD in the national legislation in the first place. Ratification is not enough in many countries. Yes, definitely agree with that. Um, and then we have another comment that says, I think we need to work with the citizens who are not aware of this agenda. With the strong public opinions, the government cannot just ignore the guidelines. Um, and then Juan is saying in Argentina, the CRPD is part of the constitution, but no national law has been adapt adapted to the CRPD since 2008. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much to everyone for the comments. 
But there's definitely a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of lobbying our governments. Um, and it's not just... Um, Sorry. In the... Yes, yes. Please go ahead. Uh, sí, uh, es Juan hablando. No se ha adaptado ninguna ley nacional. They've, they haven't adapted a national law despite the fact that the convention is in the constitution. There was no national law that was adopted. So uh, sometimes the, it's not enough to have the CRPD within the constitution. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, thank you so much for that. I agree 100%. Um, I even feel like sometimes states ratify instruments um, you know, just for the sake of ratifying with no with no intention, because you would notice that years after ratification, they haven't they haven't actually implemented anything. Um, yeah, so we definitely need to <laughs> be stronger in lobbying our governments. Um, Rita, can you perhaps display some of the responses? Yes, I have to and then the Um, oh, okay, Rita, I can't see the responses. So if you yeah, can... I will need to to read them out because they are on the Zoom website. Yes, we so, can read out before we close the session. We have yeah, uh, maybe we can take some other interventions so I can have a bit of time to check them. Would that be okay? okay? No problem. Um, I'll go back to the chat function. Um, Josephine says, implementation of the policy is the issue we should lobby lab for. Um, yes, no, I definitely agree with that. And I also think implementation needs to be, um, you know, holistically tackled. So I think we can't just rely on our governments, um, but government also needs to be open to working with um, individuals with disabilities and also OPDs and other CSOs. Um, yeah, so I definitely agree with that. Um, and then, uh, sorry, sorry for butchering your name, but Shi Wu Wang is saying successful repatriation cases. How is it, how is it successful and what is its significance? Um, is that question directed at anyone specifically? Um, or is there anyone that, that knows how to respond to that? Yes, go ahead. Okay, I don't, I don't see anyone who would like to respond to that intervention. So I'll just read another one from the chat box, which says, um, we should make sure to use underpinning laws to ensure the governments are held accountable to what they are required to do. Yes, yes, I agree with that completely. Um, I think governments have escaped accountability for far too long. So I think we definitely need stronger laws to deal with that specifically. Um, yes, uh, Rita, have... I will maybe Lorena ready to go. Yeah. Lorena wants to intervene. She has her hand raised. Oh, yes, please go ahead. Lorena, please go ahead. Hola, eh, buen día. Good eh, morning. Gracias. Thank you for uh, sharing this. Yesterday, I finished a uh, uh, capacitation with um, health, mental health services in the Patagonia of Chile, in Chiloé, and something I need to report after this training we had yesterday is that all who intervene in these processes are the APEs, which is the first uh, mental health instance, where we begin with our processes, with our disabilities, they don't even know what is this institutionalization is. And they think that it, it is just related to closing psychiatrics and that they are going to be without jobs. That's what they believe. 
So my position is that from the, the governor, central governments, and from ministries, there is no even a socialization of what is the meaning of this institutional size. So it starts to be a bad uh, guideline because it's a cartoon for uh, psych psychiatrists, for psychologists, for social workers who are the ones that intervene on our cases. And on the other hand, I noticed that to achieve this disinstitutionalization, we need to talk about governance and how the social and community levels should intervene within our own processes, in our disabilities. And we then have uh, trainings in good practices related to local governances is the only way we can move to this digitalization and understanding that this is a process because it is a process it's not a result but we don't have registers of good practices and that's why states and health ministries just ratify but do not implement it because they just work uh, for specific indicators and goals. That's the way the state works with statistics and figures, but we are not within these statistics, our good practices at the grassroots levels, at the social levels, because this is not taken into account at the um, health level. So I think we need to map our good practices and characterize them so we can show it at the national and international level. So everywhere where the um, guideline is taken, so we can also make visible that we can implement, that we already have some practices, good practices, and that they can be implemented. Wrap up the, your response, as we're running out of time. Sabiha, I think we will have to move on to Manel yes. uh, because yes. we are, yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much to everyone for your responses. And if there's anyone that would still like to contribute, can you please um, just send us an email? Thank you so much once again for everyone's contributions. I'd now like to hand over to my colleague Manel from Inclusion International. Thank you, over to you Manel. Thank you, Sabeha. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, I'll try to rush um, uh, as we are behind of the time. Um, so I'm uh, the Global Advocacy Manager of Inclusion International. Uh, we are the global network of people with intellectual disabilities and their families. Um, so I will talk about the available languages and formats of the DI guidelines. So as you know, because it is a UN document, it was um, uh, translated into the official uh, UN languages. So you can find all the, uh, the English, French, Spanish, Arabic, and other version um, on the OHCHR website. Um, but then, um, because uh, as part of the promotion work of the of the G global coalition on deinstitutionalization, we tried to develop other languages and to translate the the guidelines in other languages. Um, some that we did um, like directly by some members of the coalition have uh, done the translations. Um, or we have supported and encouraged other parties to do the translation. So currently, if we can move to the next slide, please, uh, we, there has there is more than 12 um, translations of the GI guidelines uh, in 12 more than 12 languages. Some are still ongoing. Um, in addition to the uh, technical document, the, the guidelines themselves. So some languages also exist in easy to read formats, uh, the ones that you can see on the screen here. Um, and uh, in addition to the uh, easy read language, we also tried to develop 
uh, we developed videos that describe the guidelines uh, to make them more accessible. Um, so, sorry. So um, these videos, there is uh, 16 videos which describes different chapters, all the chapters of the guidelines. And these exist in English and in Spanish. So you can find um, the easy read versions, the videos uh, link, as well as all the translated um, versions of the GI guidelines on the Global Coalition website and on the um, official OHCHR website. Um, I put the, the links um, in the chat so you can see them. Um, also, please let us know if you are aware of any other um, translation, if you did one or uh, you are willing to translate in your own, um, in your native language uh, or your language country. So I can see here in the chat that there is a Polish translation. Please, that would be good if you can share it with us. So we will uh, share it on the Global Coalition website and we will make sure also to have it on the OHCHR um, website. Um, can we move to the next slide, please, Ines? Yes. Um, so thank you. Um, I won't take more time and we'll let just a few minutes for Nadia to uh, wrap up and conclude. Thanks a lot. Thank you for all who are still with us and thank you for all the speakers who stay with us all this time and for the engagement. So we hear a lot today. We hear especially lack of engagement of governments a lack of goodwill, a lack of understanding, a lack of also engagement of OPDs, uh, sometimes because they misunderstand or not aware. So there is still a lot of work to do. And that's why the Global Coalition is there proposing you the next webinars. So on the 20, uh, 30 April at 15 CET, Disability Rights International will organize an intersectionality in the process of deinstallation. The one after will be on the 9th of May at three o'clock again, and this time it's Inclusion International will organize and take the lead. And it will, the topic is inclusive community support services, systems and networks. In June, we don't know the dates yet, but it's then Validity Interna Foundation will organize on the topic legal policy frameworks, remedies, reparations, and redress. In September, TCI will organize access to mainstream services. And then in October, there will be um, uh, in will organize duty of state parties and key elements of the DI process. In November, the University of Pretoria will organize on, on the topic emergency DI and international cooperation. And then last but not least in December, IDA will organize a session on disaggregated data and monitoring framework. And this all with the objective and the hope that we would realize and facilitate that transition and uh, realize uh, the internalization for everybody. So um, we are out of time. I will thank the translators for keeping with us the sign language interpreter, the captioning, all the organizers uh, and uh, from the global coalition, all our colleagues who are there, all the participants, those who stayed so late, those who wake up very early, but it's just the begin. So we can, I hope we can join forces and realize the eye for all of us. Thank you very much and see you on the next um, yeah, don't hesitate. If you have any question, any suggestion to contact uh, the Global Coalition through the email that you can find back uh, in the chat. So thanks a lot. Enjoy all your weekend and see you on the next webinar at latest. Bye, everybody. <laughs>